Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. Hey, Peter. Hey, Tanya. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. So it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Excited for this conversation with the one and only Lynn Sherritt. Yes, Lynn is. Uh, so Lynn is somebody that I actually got to know well over 10 years ago. Man, that makes me feel old. Um, but anyway, that's just a side note. Experienced. She, <laughs> I was writing. I was writing for Ed Week and I was doing, I was going to be writing a blog because she wrote a book with Michael Follin for Corwin called Putting Faces on Data. And I just, at the time, and I talk about this a little bit with Lynn today, um, at the time as a school principal, we were getting hit with so many accountability measures and we were the data, data this and data that, that it started to become a very dirty four letter word. And I needed a book like Putting Faces on Data. So when I read it, I just, I wanted to write a blog about it. And that's how I connected with Lynn. And then she and I actually trained together for visible learning for John Hattie's work. So she's somebody I deeply respect. I love anytime I get to talk with her. Um, and this podcast was no different. So we talked about the 10 year anniversary of putting faces on data, but we also talked about something that she does, which is her clarity learning suite. So when people are listening, they will learn more about the importance of uh, clarity of learning. And I think Lynn articulates that very, very well. Yeah, Lynn is, Lynn is what I call the real deal. I mean, this is a person who's really, she rolls up her sleeves, she gets in there and she really uh, tries to help practitioners get the work done. And what I really liked about, especially the opening of this interview is, um, this is a seminal book, but I didn't really know the backstory to it. So hearing Lynn talk a little bit about where the genesis of this idea and how, you know, she's in the middle, like you said, of, you know, people really getting stressed out about data and accountability and probably just lots of fear circulating in the room and how she was able to kind of cut through that and really figure out what was missing and, and what was needed so that people could move on and do the really important work. So I thought that was really interesting um, to learn. So I think this is going to be, as always, a really great uh, listen for people. And, you know, this this is the book. If you're not sure which five books to have, if you're a new leader, <laughs> you know, Faces is one of those books you want to have on your shelf. For sure. So I hope everybody enjoys the interview. Okay. Enjoy. Lynn Sherrod, welcome to the uh, Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. It is so nice to see you. So good to see you, Peter. Even though we're far away, we're really quite close. How good I, is that? Yeah, I know, exactly. You're in Australia right now. I'm in the United States. But, uh, you know, you know that I have always held you in such high esteem. I remember well over 10 years ago, I wrote a blog for Education Week on um, putting faces on the data. And so I definitely want to talk about that because I know you're experiencing the 10th anniversary. And then, of course, we've, you know, we've gone through visible learning together and, and all of that kind of stuff. So it's just it's you're somebody that I deeply respect. So it's really nice to have this opportunity to actually sit down and talk to you about all of the work that you're doing. And you're just doing so much great, impactful work. Thanks, Peter. I, I remember that podcast. I, I think I have what you said framed. You were looking <laughs> at, um, yeah, do you remember that? Uh, aren't you looking at impactful women or something? Oh, yes. Oh, my that's gosh, that's I right. Have. I did. I listed you. You were one of the 18 most um, impactful women in education. And yes, I wrote about that. And, and I still... You've proven me right. Let's just put it that way. You, you've actually proven <laughs> me right because, um, like I said back then, and that was that was years ago. Yes. You just had such an impact on what I do in in my role, both you know from a professional learning standpoint, and also the whole idea of writing books. You know, I've learned so much from from reading what you write, and I'd like to actually get there. Let's let's talk about putting faces on the data. It's the tenth anniversary. Mm -hmm. Back then, 
about eight, 10 years ago. I, I remember just thinking that this book was so incredibly important because you took something that almost seemed like it was supposed to be common sense. Like, are we actually, and but something we forgot about, which is we were forgetting to put the faces on the data and to talk about the lives of, of students. And that's why I found that book to be so impactful because at a time when I was still a school principal in New York State, which was increasing accountability and talking about data and talking about all of that, I almost had a critical view of data. And I read your book and it changed my perspective. And I really do mean that. I was in a bad place when it came to data. I was starting to be in a negative place just because of the accountability movement. And I read your book and I instantly went back to, okay, I get it. Yeah, that was so, um, that was so amazing. That happened uh, as I was uh, superintendent in uh, a very large school district north of Toronto. And everybody was grumbling about face uh, about data and and uh, the statistical nature and we were having arguments and and finally I don't know it was one of those light bulb mo moments that you have periodically where I said look those are real kids that mm -hmm. we're talking about let's put the faces on those students who are they what do we know about them uh, let's let's talk about where they've been who knows this student do we all know 10 things about that student beyond the academics? And how can we come together and put faces, on, real faces on the data through photos and take a look at those students that we're really wondering about? So our first data walls, and they continue to be wondering walls and questioning walls. What do we know about each face and how to teach each one? That's the key. So we move from uh, widgets and uh, percentages to actual numbers of students. And then we progress to tags that had their pictures on them. And it, they were in a private place. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those aha moments. This is for us to talk about students and move from knowing one thing about them to knowing many things about them. And then connecting that to a meeting where we would come and talk about instruction, the assessment, not the student, the uh, student's piece of work comes to that case management meeting and we unpack positively, what can this student do? And then it's an asset based approach because we build on what we already know about the student. And in doing that in a small meeting, we raise the uh, capacity of teachers and leaders to teach all students, know each student, and teach each one. Yeah, and I think in those cases, it's so easy, depending on who your leader is, what school you're coming from, to have a deficit mindset when it comes to the data. And what I enjoyed about, about the book is that it gave the whole child perspective. It, it helped people who might have that deficit mindset go into more of a positive and a growth mindset, for lack of a better way of saying it. What yeah. is different? What, so why did you do the... With the 10th anniversary, what what inspired you to um, come back to that subject 10 years later? Yeah, it was very, it was interesting, Peter, because uh, our publisher Corwin uh, wrote an email to both Michael Fullen and I and said, "You know, it's been 10 years. Are you interested in doing a sequel?" And, you know, at first I looked at the email and thought, 10 years. It couldn't possibly be 10 years." <laughs> And then uh, Michael wrote and said, well, what do you think? You think we could do that? And I'm, you know, it was one of those moments where I said, sure, we can do it. Yeah. And then you know how much work there is in writing a book. So <laughs> yeah. Through the whole thing, oh, why are we doing this? But then we kept thinking, I kept thinking of those students' faces that I've met all along the way, who actually were able to learn to read and to write and to think critically. And so those faces inspired us both. And we said, you know, it's a really great title and we've got really great work in that book. We'll just, uh, we'll review it. We'll put in all new case studies and vignettes and, and our new thinking that augments the first edition. So that's what we did. So it literally just came out. That's congratulations. And and yeah, I had, um, so Michael has been a guest on the, on the podcast as well. Yeah. And I, 
very much enjoy the two of you coming back to something that might seem like common sense, but it's the human side of all of this as well, right? It's not exactly. just the data side, it's the human side, which I absolutely love, especially at this time um, after COVID. One of the, yeah. you were talking, you know, you were a school leader and now you do all this um, very impactful work around the world, which I want to definitely get deeper into. But I want to ask, how did your experience as a district leader um, prepare you for the work that you're doing now? Uh, I, I lean on my work as a district leader constantly, because if we don't have a clear vision, if we don't have that um, strategic plan that uh, supports the clear vision, if teachers and leaders in every school don't have the skills to do this work uh, it's and the resources to do this work, it's our uh, opportunity to um, scaffold their learning in uh, a very, uh, I think, deep and personal way, taking uh, teachers and leaders from where they are to where they need to become. Uh, teachers of all students, and I really mean all. So this is uh, teachers and leaders becoming intervention teachers. They know how to teach each student. So that's that's the big piece, Peter, of being a district leader, the small piece. So thinking big, but starting small. Mm -hmm. Michael Fullen and I have an evidence-based um, framework for system in school mm -hmm. improvement. We call the 14 parameters. And we invite uh, our leaders and teachers to come in school teams to assess where they are and where their data may be against those 14. And they select one, six, and 14 as a non-negotiable, but then work on one other that reflects their data. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we start. We do four small steps. Mm -hmm. And when they see uh, improvement and they go deeply into those four, um, then they select other of the parameters and really the parameters were uh, weaved together. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a process and it starts with district leadership, having a clear vision, knowing what the data says. And at the system level, also having a data wall mm -hmm. that looks at how, uh, how schools are being differentiated by their support. And uh, so for me, it's, it's really that flow chart in our minds of the importance of district leadership, reaching out and walking alongside school leaders and having a framework to assess where everyone is at. Was there anything that ever, when you, when you left your district leadership role and started to do all of this research and, and all the work when you started to work with schools and leaders, was there anything that you naturally did as a school leader that you were a little surprised that people weren't doing in their roles when they were? Yeah. Um, does that question make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, moving out of my very large jurisdiction, well, then I decided I wanted to teach. I wanted to continue to teach. So I do continue to teach at the University of Toronto. My students are just a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ensure that there was a direct line from that uh, system leadership position to the school leadership position to every teacher. So I was going to continue to teach. And what I found uh, really surprising was that no one really made the specific link between the curriculum expectations and the work of assessment that improves instruction in every classroom. So I really work hard at uh, ensuring that those folks I work with start with the curriculum. And it's, um, it's that waterfall chart uh, in clarity that helps us with that framework. And that framework fits inside parameter number three, that uh, we have quality teaching and learning that is assessment that informs instruction in every classroom. So to me, everything fits to be together. But our mandate uh, is as teachers and leaders to start with the curriculum expectations. Mm -hmm. So I, I use a unit of study uh, as my example. And I ask people to find the, uh, the curriculum expectations for it. 
we develop our learning intentions. We are learning to, we are learning about, we are learning that. And from the learning intentions in the curriculum deck, uh, expectations, you can find this, uh, the standards. They become um, the student-friendly in appropriate student-friendly language for that year level, uh, the success criteria. And I think, Peter, uh, the other surprise I think I've had is if teachers understand we start with the curriculum expectation and we unpack them in student-friendly language, uh, year appropriate level for students, we deconstruct work on the words, then we skip, we often skip the next step. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, students know how to be successful. Well, actually they don't. Mm -hmm. So we need to then find the success criteria statements in the curriculum and de not deconstruct the learning intentions, but co-construct the success criteria with students. So students live in how to be successful. Mm -hmm. and for me, that assessment piece of the waterfall chart is really the heart of system and school improvement. Mm -hmm. If we built that culture of learning, that third teacher surrounding the schools and the students with, um, with that focus on learning and how to be successful, then everything else in our waterfall chart depends on the success criteria. We give students descriptive feedback against the co-constructed success, cri success criteria. We give students the, um, uh, we give students opportunity to peer and self-assess against the success criteria. And finally, we have students setting their own goals for learning against the success criteria. So that's really key, and that's a surprise to me as you ask, because um, it's not really clear that um, that there is a process there to become assessment literate. And as John Hattie says, and I love John's exercises, and you and I studied John together, mm -hmm. studied John's work together, uh, we, uh, we look at those effect sizes that validate this work. So when I look at the uh, assessment waterfall chart, and John and I have talked about this, I think it has a value of an effect size of two, mm -hmm. because he looks at them individually. I look at them together. They're powerful. Yeah. Do you think student, do you think, um, what do you say to teachers, and I'm sure you probably experience this when you're running professional learning as well, what do you say to teachers who kind of resist the idea of building, developing success, success criteria with their students? Um, do you ever experience that? Absolutely, because teachers uh, say to me, oh, this takes too much time and, you know, I have to cover the curriculum. Yeah. yeah. So I say, well, I first of all say, uh, just do it. Give it a go mm. just once. And, you know, I think I'm going to write a book someday, Peter, that says, just do it. But I actually think Nike wouldn't like that. Yeah, I was going to say you might get in trouble there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I have a, I have a lot of, um, I work with uh, primary schools, elementary schools, middle yeah. schools, and secondary schools. And secondary school teachers often say, you know, I my um, curriculum uh, course is so jam full, I'll, I'd never get time to stop and co-construct meaning um, through developing a process to yeah. unpack the success criteria. And, and I say to them, you know, uh, if you just um, take a look at a learning intention and uh, put it up uh, on a screen or hopefully something where it won't go away, actually, um, and then take baby steps. So we know the end point is students living in the success criteria, but I'm just encourage them, you know, just put one that you've discovered when students are working on wicked problems, just stop for a moment, say, ah, oh, I want the two of you to say something. What can you do now that you couldn't do before this wicked, wicked problem investigation started? And they say, you know, I uh, know what concave and convex mirrors are. I can distinguish between the two. Excellent. So I write it down on a chart paper, uh, on the iPad, wherever it is, and hopefully it won't go away. And in that way, 
uh, it's embedded in our, our teaching. I use that with my students at university and um, we together just take a moment in solving some wicked problem to say, what can you do now that you couldn't do before? Mm -hmm. And record that in a visible way. So uh, it's baby steps towards where we want them to be. But uh, I write in clarity, I have um, in Armadale here in uh, in Australia, Regiment, so the principal of O'Connor Catholic Collegiate, was at one of my sessions and said, "Oh, Lynn, I'm really busy. That sounds like an amazing process, but I'm I'm really busy." So I said, "Reg, why don't you just give it a try?" So not only was she the principal of the Catholic school, but she taught a section of Year Twelve Chemistry with a new teacher. How good is that? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, Reg gave it a go with Bradley Powers, and uh, she wrote me back about three weeks later and said, oh, wow. At the end of this unit, 100% of the students accomplished an A mm -hmm. because we had set the success criteria so specifically geared to what an A looks like that she said it was magnificent. They all uh, excelled. And so, of course, what did I say? Uh, Reg. Write that up for me. <laughs> exactly. exactly. As, as we do, right, Peter, as we do. And so absolutely, she uh, has a section uh, in uh, in that chapter on assessment and instruct, I guess, just on assessment of how to co-construct success criteria at the secondary level. So yeah. there are lots of uh, examples of teachers really being able to unpack with students what the assessment will be. So it will be no surprise to students uh, when they come to the final assessment task in a unit of study, what they need to be able to do. And I think that's only fair for students. Yeah, and I, I develop success criteria with um, with adults when I'm coaching and, and running workshops and stuff, because I think it's it's been um, a really great way to elevate their voice, but also to keep us all on track of what we actually value out of this. You mentioned clarity, and I want to be able to get to a couple of things because I could talk to you forever. But you have the book on clarity, but you also have the clarity learning suite. How are these two things connected? And, and can you tell me a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So I think around 2016, Arnis, and we know Arnis, our mm -hmm. editor, uh, said, write every, I want you to write a book, everything you know about system and school improvement. So it became the book of 11, uh, no, the, it became the book of 611 pages. Wow. And Arnis, Arnis wrote back to me and said, Lynn, we've never published a 611 page book as an educational text. And so he said, so cut it in half. I went, oh, cut it in half. So it took me another two years. I cut it in half, and um, and so at about the same time, um, one of my uh, colleagues in Australia and two from New Zealand said to me, you know, you really need to get this work on record. You know, this is so um, impactful. It's making a difference to uh, increase students' growth and achievement everywhere. Uh, it needs to go on record. So... Uh, and they had, uh, they had a little different view than I did. And so they actually came, convinced me and also my husband, Jim, to um, think about a platform. So uh, Mike Ogram from New Zealand developed the most amazing platform that's very interactive, drop down and 20, not only 24 seven, but all my resources that I use wow. in my um, sessions are available. And uh, so it became the Clarity Learning Suite uh, and it wasn't a workshop. It's um, 12 modules that absolutely reflect um, clarity, what matters most in learning, teaching, and leading. Everything I do um, from introduction of the 14 parameters then to going deeply into assessment, instruction, and of course, leadership, because leadership underpins and is essential uh, to go deeply into uh, the improvement work in every school. So uh, it's it's certainly available, and I continue to put up um, 
my resources, new resources, videos. I love videos. And uh, so 12 modules, 43 sessions I videoed so, and uh, integrated uh, in each session a, a fundamental challenge that reflects the uh, teaching. And we have over we have over 1,600 participants now. Wow, congratulations. That's, I mean, that's such an amazing resource. I, you know, you know this because I've talked to you before, but um, you have always been one of my role models when it comes to delivering professional learning, just not only with your level of depth and your experience and everything else that you have, but also with the fact that you don't do it in a one and done kind of fashion. It right. definitely has to be a relationship. Yeah. It has to be long term, and that's what all the greatest research says about professional yeah. learning. But you're somebody yeah. who actually does that really well. As and we wrap Peter, it up, can you talk a little bit about that your professional learning model? Because I think a lot of people yeah. need to learn from you where that's concerned. They, it's so easy for them to go do a one and done, go to a conference, go to whatever. But the way you do it is so impactful and so real. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, my my first message message in our sessions is we don't do anything. We we don't ask schools we don't ask schools to do anything that we're not prepared to do as system leaders. Mm -hmm. So if we think it's important in parameter six to put faces on the data by having a small data wall, who those faces are, and that lead to a case management meeting, uh, everyone in the groups that I work with must also do the same thing. So I work with system leaders and. Um, at every session, the system leaders are there sitting among the table groups. I work with, uh, and we usually do a cohort. So I work maybe five years in a jurisdiction. I work there until I see great improvement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll work in cohorts if it's a large system. And I'm here in South Australia, all of, uh, of South Australia Catholic education, 101 schools are with me and were with me yesterday. They come in school teams. There's an expectation that what I present, the schools will chunk out and take back in small bits uh, to staff. So every staff knows what they know. And we keep this going. I come twice a year. And in the meantime, I do check-ins with school teams on Zoom, which has been probably one of the only benefits for me of COVID, <laughs> other than the Clarity Learning Suite, that there have been some aspiring leaders have emerged um, through this process. Um, but I think John Hattie's words ring really true to me. So what? What's the impact? So I've been writing what's the impact, both in Clarity uh, and demonstrating impact knowing students' faces, how to teach each, and moving them from a D or an E to an A or a B, and the instructional approaches to make that happen. So impact is really big for me in this work. I think that's the integrity that we need to ask ourselves as leaders. Am I making a difference for every student, every learner, teacher, and leader in my care? And um, when I when I think of impact, I've just um, worked across Wales uh, using uh, the Clarity text. And Dr. Alma Harris, who I think we do both know very well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was working and I asked the Welsh government who I was working for that I needed to have someone research what I was doing uh, all the time I was working across uh, all secondary schools. Um, in each jurisdiction in Wales. And uh, so they selected Alma, thank goodness. And Alma and her team provided that research. And I can send you that uh, report to the Welsh government about the work in Clarity uh, as being very positive, but also for me important that it's about impact. I think so. And, and that's, I think that's where we're going to end it because you definitely inspire me to always want to make sure that I'm focusing on impact. And you do such a fantastic job of it in everything that you do, whether it's writing books, writing, you know, delivering professional learning in person, doing it online with, with the Clarity Learning Suite. So Lynn Sherr, thank you so much for being on Leaders Coaching Leaders. Thanks so much, Peter DeWitt. I hope we see each other again soon. Absolutely. All right, Tanya, so 
you know, one of the things, I mean, while there are many things that I really admire about Lynn, number one, people probably don't know this, but I'm highly intimidated when I get into a conversation with Lynn. I really am. I'm not just saying that. Like there are there are times when you're in the room with somebody who you know is very, very smart. And I'm worried that I'm, you know, I hope I don't say anything um, unintelligent when I'm with Lynn, but she's just so calming and I enjoy our conversations and she's a she's deep on many levels. And one of the things that I enjoyed, I need, it actually, the conversation inspired me to ask this question during the podcast, which was, you know, she was talking about being a district leader um, at a very large district in, in Toronto. And I like instantly thought about people who write books and people who come in with experiences. Sometimes that missing piece is that you have these ideas, but they don't always connect well from a district standpoint, or sometimes you're a district leader and you can't bring it to an area where people could understand it in a book. And, you know, yeah. you, Morgan and I talk in a podcast about writing books, um, writing educational books. So when I was thinking about Lynn and I asked that question about, she went from, you know, teacher to building leader to district leader to running workshops. She's highly respected. I mean, when we, when I talked to her, Today it was um, she. She's in Australia presently, and she spends a lot of time there. I mean, she's world renowned, yeah. and um, she can really bring it down and bring it to a level that we we that we understand. So she, I think, has a really she has a really great way of offering the practical and the theoretical all at the same time. Yeah, she definitely bridges and marries that theory and practice um, uh, as as good as anyone. Um, yeah, listening to this, I mean, the thing that I, I really, really like about Lynn and her work, and I think speaks to the, the figure that she is in the field, is, you know, everything she says that for some people is just a saying or a platitude or just kind of empty, like all children can learn. Yes. Then she adds this piece of, you know, she says, teachers and leaders becoming intervention teachers. Like part of her practice is everybody thinks about what do all children need? And, and when you hear her say things like that, you understand why she is able to get the kind of her and her team. It's never a job of one, but having a leader who gets this matters yeah. and that she really instills this idea that it's not any one person's job to do a piece of the work. It's everybody's job and it's a mindset. Um, and, and just a line like that for me really crystallizes why this work continues to be so important a decade later um, and will likely be a decade beyond. Yeah, to me, she's the epitome of when I, I, I mean, I actually, years ago, I wrote a blog about 18, um, 18 women all educators should know and yeah. Lynn, was, Lynn was on the list. And I wanted to, I, I focused on her because quite honestly, when I'm writing about instructional leadership or when I'm thinking about instructional leadership, Lynn to me is the epitome of somebody that I think of when it comes to instructional leadership. So when we look at research that says we all need to understand, you know, we have to have a deep understand, or we have to have a understanding, knowledge, and, and also the skills of what it means to be a good learner. Lynn is one of those people that has held many roles and can do all three. She has the understanding, she has the knowledge, and she has the skills. So she is, to me, she's the epitome of, of what I think of for sure when I think of an instructional leader. Yeah, she certainly personifies it. Um, so everyone, I, I, this is a great listen. I, I would imagine lots of people agree, and I'm, I'm glad that we were able to share this with you. So Peter, until we learn again next time, uh, I look forward to seeing you. Thanks. And you know what, Tanya, that's absolutely what it means, because when we do this podcast, it is about me entering into a discussion where I'm going to learn something. So it's definitely the way that we're approaching these. So, yeah, yes. we're learners too. Always good to partner with you and see you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank, thank you, everyone. Again, see you next time.